And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, a, a, a man whose work is whose work needs no introduction for the, for those familiar with um, Frog God games and Necromancer games. If not, blame Zach. Eh, and and now is and I was work and I was working on the Pathfinder First Edition and D and D Fifth Edition conversion of the Farther All setting, made made popular thanks to the work of Zombie Orpheus Entertainment. The one and only, the man, the man better known as the man better known as a planet Mars, Michael Russell. How you doing today, man? I'm doing well. Yeah, I want, I wanted to, I wanted to go with the man formerly known known as Mars, but that would be too close to a Prince joke. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's in the it's in the name, you know, Michael Mars Gaming. So. It was either it was either that or it was either that or or say the man named after a planetary suite, but not enough people would get it. <laughs> Fair enough. Like, I try to I try to go equal amounts of highbrow and lowbrow here in the temple. Very reasonable. Yeah, but to open, I'd like to open a bit with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? All right, so this is going to be uh, silly, because my first introduction to role-playing was a licensed product, actually. It was the Hellboy RPG for GURPS. Um, was that with or without the TI-83? It, it was a little <laughs> bit more recent than that. <laughs> no, I'm... I'm I have, yeah. to, I have to give I give I give um, GURPS a fair amount of shit because of the um, math when it comes oh, yeah. to, when it comes to creation. Although, in its defense, I will I will admit that once you once you get past all the creation bullshit, GURPS is not that tr not as crunchy as people think. Well, you know, starting in GURPS, when I moved to three three uh, e three point five and eventually Pathfinder, mm -hmm. it was easy. Oh well, well, yeah, because. It's, I'd say, I'd say in your case is the equivalent of, um, your fir your first time swimming was you jumping off the high dive instead, instead of wading in the shallow pool first. <laughs> yeah, so it means that I've always favored, uh, crunchy systems, not, you know, that I don't like Savage World, Swords and Wizardry and the like, but my heart's always been with, uh, the crunchier systems, the 3X systems in particular. Mm-hmm. Now, with with that kind of th with that kind of thing in mind, was was it a case where you were where you were just a f a fan of the Hellboy comic and somebody um tip somebody tipped you off the Hellboy GURPS or was there a different route? All right, so I was at Sci Fi City, which is a big comic book store in Florida mm -hmm. um, that has been open forever, but um, I was there buying a board game, I think Munchkin. And because Munchkin and GURPS are made by the same company, Steve Jackson Games, I saw the Hellboy RPG on the same rack, and I was like, I love Hellboy. I'm going to buy this. And then, uh, about a month later, I assembled all my friends, and we spent like three sessions building characters. And then we played for like two sessions before we realized that GURPS is a terrible system if you don't know what you're doing. And then we uh, actually bought the GURPS core rulebook so that we would know what we were doing. Did so you knew slightly more of what you were doing with the with the core rulebook. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> because apparently, you know, buying a supplement to a system is not the best way to learn the system. True. Um, and I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get it. Some people might get on you for th for that being your introduction, but um, given how so many so many of my um, so many of my UK guests got their introduction through Merp, I can't I can't follow suit on that. 
Hey, I actually picked up Murps as my second uh, RPG. I got the box. I think the the best joke I can ever say about about uh, Middle Earth roleplay is designed to be a simpler version of Rollmaster. I mean, it almost does that. Yeah, it'll. I um, not too long ago, I did I did a I did an entire I did an entire se- series of reviews on um, Lord of the Rings RPGs, and I cov- and I covered um, second edition Merp, and mm-hmm. um. I had I had simply said that the that it still mostly holds up. It's just that it's just that um, something some things need some smoothing out because that was still around that time when there was the whole you didn't have a unified system. You just had you just had a bunch of subsystems. Since um, Rollmaster was a started off as a D and D hack that got out of control. <laughs> oh yeah, granted, I will admit I love subsystems. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're uh, one of the coolest things about uh, Pathfinder. Still, is that there's so many sub variants that have been published over the years, like um, the dynamic magic item creation mm-hmm. from Pathfinder Unchained. I yeah. just love every set, every campaign, being like, "Okay, guys, we're using these variant rules for this one to better fit the feel." But to compare that with something like Pathfinder what i mean is um when it comes to the when it comes to the core mechanics there um Rollmaster and a lot of games around that time didn't have an all roads lead to rome um kind of resolution like with with um, Pathfinder the d20 system all roads lead to that d20 in one form or another oh are you referring to the roll under your attribute roll a d6 roll a 1 on the D six, uh, roll percent, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. There, yeah. I mean, Rollmaster technically has a has it that you're rolling high on D one hundreds, but the way, but there isn't a universal resolution. Every 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 skill, every action has its own set of resolutions in and of itself. That's kind of what I mean by that lack of all roads lead to Rome. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, that, that's true of most of the games of that era, I think. Yeah. Um, fortunately, the um, spiritual successor against the Dark Master pretty much um, fixes that issue. Um, it's just that they, obviously they don't have the um, they don't have the Tolkien name, so instead they go with a mix of a mix of eighties high high fantasy and heavy metal. Um, but Shifting, shifting from GURPS over to the D twenty system, um, what were the chain of events that led to that? Since it, it's um, it's quite a leap for for somebody to jump between systems when one, when one has been grandfathered in. Yeah, um, honestly, I switched to D and D because it was what people played around me. Because uh, there wasn't much of a large uh, gathering of nerds for GURPS. Mm-hmm. And uh, when D&D 3.5 came out, I was aware of RPGs at the time. So I bought it basically new. Mm-hmm. So that's what caused the biggest change was the actual newest edition coming out and being all a buzz. And I've, I remember, I remember seeing some people say that, um, that three, that 3.5 was a, that 3.5, that the edition, the edition of a 3.5 was a cash grab that would cause new editions to come around every five years. Um, but if you actually go back and look at, at the, at the material that was in 3.0, there were there were a lot of holes. Uh, yeah, I still believe that you can use three e three point five and Pathfinder material fairly interchangeably if you know what you're doing. But it's definitely each set of it refines it more than the last. Yeah. Um. A while back, I did. A while back, I did kind of a look a look back at different classes throughout the editions. Um. 
some of some of them have had more rocky histories than uh, than others um and so, and some of them in their really early days were outright useless like the barbarian in um AD&D yes um, uh, rangers are the opposite though Original Rangers were great. They start with two hit die, all that. And now uh, Rangers are fairly lackluster. Ranger, in 5th edition especially, is exactly. quite possibly one of the most snake-bitten classes in that entire run. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. In 5th edition, Ranger is rather lackluster. But if you go back to, you know, Avian, the Ranger is one of, in my opinion, the best classes. Um. I think I will ad I will admit that I've heard I've heard for the longest time that s that um Skip Williams really despised um sorcerers in 3rd edition. He had a long rant that I can't that I can't seem to find where he di he did not he did not like their inclusion into the game. That's odd. They serve a reasonable role and I, that's actually why I like that oracles were added to the game because a spontaneous cleric is a good thing. Yeah, it's um to be f to be fair, um he's specifically referring to I think he was specifically referring to the er to the early 3.0 days of the sorcerer. So before before stuff like blood before stuff like bloodlines and the like were there and it was just it was just a slightly modified um spontaneous wizard. Yeah. So, in that in that context, I can kind of I can kind of understand his issue because um, even with because that spontaneous is alone isn't real isn't really enough. Like you you brought up the oracle, which yeah, it's a spontaneous cleric, but that's not the beginning and ending of what it can bring to the table. Oh no, definitely not. Just like wizards have their arcane schools, which don't do as much as a bloodline, but. The bloodline makes up for the diminished spell casting of the sorcerer compared to a wizard. Mm -hmm. The oracle does the same thing with their uh, revelations. They make up for it despite being equivalent to a domain. They have they grant more to the oracle than the cleric yeah. domain. Now, this now this kind of thing brings me to um to the to what you're currently working on with the farther all players guide um. Now, as now as I understand it, this is this is basically the guide for playing in the in the setting of Farther All that's uh, was created by Zombie Orpheus Entertainment. Um, how did you how did you first get in contact with that group? Uh, well, I go to Gen Con every year with various companies working for them, but mm -hmm. every year I go and hang out with Zombie Orpheus. And, you know, over the year, I've, years, I've, you know, talked to them a few times here and there. But then when the uh, pandemic happened and they, lo they uh, lost a significant amount of funds on non-refundable deposits that they did for the filming of Journey Quest Season 4, um, they were in a bit of a financial issue. So they were like, to, does anyone, uh, would anyone be interested in helping, you know, rebuild our losses from the pandemic? And I offered to create this product to help uh, in that regard. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> in, now with, with that, with that kind of thing in mind, um, far, farther all is, go is, it, one of the key things with it is it's is it's nine ages, each with um different play styles. So that's nine ages that you're that are going to be accommodating in um in two si in two systems. Um, how do you how do you go how do you go about that in, in order to make sure that it that um the book itself doesn't get overwhelming, so you're not carrying around say the uh, core book for hero system or something like that. Uh, so one of the biggest ways I did that was. Every race has a list of playable ages at the top, mm -hmm. and every race is roughly balanced with every other race. So that even if this race is six stage only and the other race is uh, second through nine, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Eight, your six-stage race is going to be roughly on the same power level as the one that's two through eight. Yeah. And uh, that covers it a lot of it with the races. And as for the gods, I made sure that all the gods had the same number of domains and each age roughly represents the alignments equally. Mm-hmm. Now, with the, with that in with that in mind, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to if someone's jumping into this from um from core from core, just from just from van, just from vanilla Pathfinder or vanilla D and D, putting aside putting aside ages, what would be what would be some of the modifications to the to the rules that they may have that they may have to take into account if they're run if they're running a um. If they're running a game in one of, in one of the ages, the biggest thing to take into account is that there is a second classification of magic spells. Mm-hmm. Yes, there are still schools of magic, but there are keys of magic that are drawn on from the world. And I list um, for the five E version every spell that's SRD open, mm-hmm. and what schools they are, and for the Pathfinder version, everything from the core rulebook and ultimate magic. Um, with the stipulation of any spells beyond that are at GM discretion. Mm-hmm. So, certain ages of farther all don't have access to certain keys of magic. And that's going to be your biggest thing, is that you're not necessarily going to be able to cast every single evocation spell in a certain age of magic if that key has faded from the world. Mm-hmm. That doesn't start until the sixth age, though, and your uh, fifth age is really your traditional fantasy. Yeah. Now, when it com- now when it comes to when it comes to the key when it comes to the um, keys, um, are th- are the key- are the keys of magic akin to say the um, say the magical sp- the traditional magical spheres or it or do they or do they overlap with some of the with some of the spells that spheres can handle? So the keys are a little weird. The way that they work is they are focused on one key aspect with two sub aspects. Like creation is both thaumaturgy, which is you know awakening objects, cloning, creating demi planes, etc. But the low praxis, the, the, you know, low magic version of creation is sorcery. And every spell can be cast as a sorcery spell. Mm-hmm. You just have to effectively increase the, cast, the spell level of the spell to change it to a sorcery spell. But, like, conjury is both illusion and... Um, invocation mm-hmm. so as i said there's some overlap but also a bit of difference because typically conjuration and illusion are very separate things i i can i can certainly get that now when it comes now um <clears throat> this is a question that i end up asking a lot when it comes to campaign settings <clears throat> but are there certain races or certain classes that might mu- um, ages, ages notwithstanding, might be a, might be a harder sell when it co- when it comes to integrating them within um, farther all, as far as the as far as the core ones. Core races, I ha- I am you now providing uh, at least for the Pathfinder versions, uh, basically re- uh, rewrites to increase their power level to the equivalent of the power level of the other races mm-hmm. for Pathfinder, and uh, but. The core races should mostly work. Uh, like Dragonborn for 5e, there is an equivalent in Farther All. They're called Worms, but they're only accessible during three ages, six through eight. So your Dragonborn isn't particularly playable in the traditional fantasy ages, but more towards the futuristic ages. All right, that, I, can, I can get that. Now, when it com- when it comes to when it comes to the um, eight, when it comes to the ages, um, 
this might this might be this might be a bit um ah, this might be a bit left fi left field but given how given how creative tables can get it's one of those things to consider um is it would it be theoretically possible would it be theoretically possible in setting for um for sub for a pl for player characters to um be age jumping in a campaign uh yes however it would involve uh advanced technology uh because part of the role is but one world in the tapestry of worlds mm -hmm. and you can uh, you can pierce the tapestry via a black circle which is effectively a stargate if you uh want to simplify it mm -hmm. and travel to other worlds and time can pass differently on other worlds like um, if you use the gamer uh, movies as an example mm -hmm. the difference of the late 90s of the original gamers when that takes place and the gamers hands of fate in 2013 uh takes place in the beginning of the uh, uh, fifth age for the um, original movie, and mm -hmm. it's at the end of the fifth age to the beginning of the sixth age for the final movie. Mm -hmm. So that is a difference of maybe 20 years on Earth for what is over a thousand years on Farther All. So you could easily go to a another plane another world in the tapestry of worlds and uh change ages and there's also not to say that there aren't some of the races and ages that aren't represented as their typical ages because things like the cog which show up in the seventh age uh they were discovered after having been existing for no one knows how long and the in setting, they they were created during the first age, but they were never found in wide numbers until the seventh age. And I'm I'm guessing that's one of those talk with your GM kind kind of kind of situations if that comes up. Exactly, because I'm putting the ages where they are commonplace, where you can see them. I don't want to say regularly, for but you know, mm -hmm. they are a living, breathing part of the world and are interacting with the overarching story of the world during those ages. Yeah. Now, when it comes... Now, um... Obviously, obviously, there's... There's a few, um... There's a few... There's a few races that are going That are non-core that are gonna be added into, um, Into this. And I'd like... I'd like to go over, um... I'd like to go over th the, um... Three of the... I'd like to go over a few of them just to just to get a feel for how they're going to work, and obviously in in one case um, it's going to be it's going to be similar but different. Um, and the one I'd like to start with is the is the Ald. Ah uh, yes, the Ald. They are the elf progenitors. They are came over from uh, Countermay, or the Counterweight world, which is. The world that Gamers Hands of Fate card game aspect takes place in. Mm -hmm. And they are, you know, fairly interesting, but they will they fit the role on the world of elves, basically. They are the elves of that age. There are no elves in that age. But they are fairies because they are of the Tuatha. They are the uh Summer Court, the Sealy of the Tuatha. Mm -hmm. They have some unique abilities, like uh, they can travel to a simultaneous reality, which is called the Veil, mm -hmm. and it's the true side of reality, or so they call it. It's what they use for fast traveling and uh, things like that. And they are the only race that can go behind the veil. All all right. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to the co when it comes to the cogs, would it be fair of me to say that they're essentially clockwork machine clockwork machines or a clockwork kind of 
Warforged like? They are very much Warforged liked. Uh, they are uh, clockwork creatures. These were actually the ones I was referring to earlier that were discovered in the Seventh Age, but were probably built by the gods in the First Age. Mm -hmm. uh, they're really interesting because. They maintain consciousness via memory chips, basically. So if a cog's body is killed, their memory chip can be transferred to a new body, and that would effectively reincarnate them. That sounds like, it sounds like the hard part would be actually finding a new body. Uh, yes, they are not recreatable as far as anyone knows how to do except cogs. Mm -hmm. Now the ne the next one that I have next one that I have on my have on my list is um is uh, is dark elves and I realize that our elves are different is a is a um, well-worn entry in t in TV tropes but um what would what would be the fundamental differences between dark elves and the more traditional drow? Dark elves are not underground dwellers at all. They are they are the descendant race from the other side of the Tuatha, the Unseelie court. Mm -hmm. So they are also from Countermay. And have came to farther all through a black uh, circle, but they have a lot more fey aspects because of this. They are uh, weak to cold iron and things like that. And most of their abilities are actually done via pheromones because they can replicate the pheromones of any race. Which, may, which certainly certainly makes sense. Um. Now next is the Darrow, which um, appearance appearance wise feel very um, dwarfy. Yes, they are half dwarf, half human. Um, it's interesting you bring that kind of thing up, since um, I remember the mole being introduced as a ha as a half dwarf, half human in um, Dark Sun. Uh, yes, they are not very similar to the mole. Mm -hmm. uh, they are. Slightly short slash slightly tall, you know, dwarf human, respectively, yeah. slightly tall dwarf, slightly short human. Yeah. But they are craftsmen and sailors more than manual laborers, like the mole typically are. Mm -hmm. Now, given that you mentioned that the uh, that the um, that the uh, that the dark elves um, are descended from the Unseelie court, or you. Would it be fair of me to say that the elves in this setting are descended from the Seelie? Uh, they are descended from the Ald, mm -hmm. uh, who transformed into into the Ald when they entered farther all and were the Seelie court. Yes. All right. Um, I fi and I figure I figure when it I figure when it comes to that some in both cases some um some of the st some of the um more common stereotypes especially the um superiority complex aren't as present in certain ages? No, especially ages 6 through 8, which is when elves return the farther all. They are not very superior feeling at all. Ages 2 through 4, they feel superior, but after the cataclysm that uh, erased elves from farther all for the 5th age, mm -hmm. uh, they came back much more humble. Now, with now, um, in a, also, I'd be I'd be remiss if I didn't if I didn't point out that um, that one one of the arts in the um, in the pre in the preview you sent me looks a, looks a little bit as as it looks a little bit too much like the like the dungeon master from that old D and D cartoon. Ah <laughs> uh, yes, uh, th that art is an art that I uh, purchased that was uh, originally done as a memoriam for Gary Gygax. Mm -hmm. uh, no. and, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, and as the dungeon master in the original D&D &D cartoon was a gnome, I felt that it 
it would be most suitable to use the art that was done in honor of Gary Gygax as my gnome racial art. Mm -hmm. Now, since we kind we kind of we kind of touched into into the matter of the uh, keys, but I'd um I'd like I'd like to go I'd like to go a little bit a little bit further in with e with each key with each key as I as I see it to kind of get a general general vibe of what the of what that key has in its um particular purview. Right. Uh... So the first one is um voyance. So voyance is kind of divination. It is one of the two forbidden types of magic is uh, uh, karasurgy, which is omen. It is a power that is limited to the gods, is what the gods say, at least. Mm -hmm. But uh, augury is the high praxis, praxis of voyance, which is divining the future via m regular things. You know, asking questions of the gods, uh, clear audience, communing with nature, uh, things like that. Detecting magic is also falls under augury mm -hmm. and things. But as I said, you know, chirosurgy or omen magic is governs, you know, deific curses and boons, things like that. As well as... Uh, Things like altering the timeline as something where you could make a declaration on reality and it would be so. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and uh, whenever it com whenever it comes to messing with that kind of thing, I can see why that would be forbidden because well, mess messing with space time never leads to good things. <laughs> exactly. Um. Well, that that in my um, a cer a certain a certain reviewer I follow has has had the has had the analogy for the longest time of time travel is bullshit. <laughs> yes, and uh, the gods forbid it. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, one of the earliest demigods of the setting was ascended to demigodhood to stop them from continuing to use time travel shenanigans. Because hey, because hey, if he's if he's outside a mor if he's outside the mortal realm, well, he can't he one he can't do that, and two ev two if he does it, every god within earshot is gonna know about it, and um, probably give him a good Phyllis style welcome. Exactly, because uh, what they discovered was the ability to split the timeline and observe ten different variations of the timeline simultaneously and pick the one that they want the most. Mm-hmm. Which uh, the gods did not like, as that could theoretically undo an act of the of gods by just making choosing the timeline that that act never happened in. Yep. Now, where now that brings us to the second key, um, imburi, which I probably mispronounced. <laughs> imburi is correct. Uh, imburi is inherently the act of adjusting the properties of something, mm -hmm. increasing or decreasing their uh, severity, uh, bestowing conditions, temporary and permanent, like a burst of strength, a moment of clarity, recurring nightmares, things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's the type of magic that builds on itself. So the more imbury you do on something, you can create permanent imburies. Yeah. The third key... Organokurgi. Where, where yeah. would that fall into? That's your healing magic, your resurrections, uh, some of your necromancy. Mm -hmm. It's also your animating plants, uh, things like that. Um, it's the modification of the physical body. And that includes things like uh, wilting plants or creating plagues in addition to, you know, your resurrection and uh, animate dead, breath mm -hmm. of life, etc. Because animate dead is also an aspect of organic energy 
as it is all manipulation of organic matter. Mm -hmm. So the the fourth key, which um which do, which doesn't have as doesn't have as many entries, um, Nexus. All right, so Nexus is the key that governs the creation and conversion of uh, magic into tangible substances. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, things that exist as Nexus are things that all like bless water, curse water, things that make holy unholy water, you know. But the biggest thing is every single potion is of the Nexus key. Mm -hmm. Every single alchemical item is of the Nexus key. So it doesn't matter what key the potion would uh, would be if you had cast the spell. The act of making it a potion turns it into a nexus spell. Now, the fifth the fifth key, transubstantiation. Um, what what would that some what would that key's umbrella be in? All right, so transubstantiation covers two big things. One is altering, you know, the state or form of matter, uh, you know, gas, liquid, uh, solid, that kind of thing. And the other is changing one uh, substance to another, you know, lead to gold style. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is turning things into, say, fire falls under transubstantiation. So you're going to get, you're transforming the air into fire by transforming it into energy and igniting it. So, things like a fireball mm -hmm. fall under. And the sixth, the sixth is um, conjury. Um, and what, and what, what would fall under that? Weirdly enough, the biggest thing that falls under conjury is illusions because it's the creation of false sensory data and the temporary manifestation of physical substance. Mm -hmm. So some spells, uh, long-term illusions, uh, uh, anything like uh, Big B's uh, giant hand, sorry, regular mage's hand, mm -hmm. mage hand, don't call it Big B's anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, secure shelter, secret chest, but it's also going to cover things like uh, any of the shadow spells, shadow, conjuration, evocation, etc. Mm -hmm. Silence, invisibility. Now, that br and that brings us to the final key, um, creation. Creation is the only, has the only other forbidden type of magic, which is thaumaturgy, as well as sorcery. Mm-hmm. Um, th uh, thaumaturgy is the act of working miracles. It is your things that are altering reality by creating something new. And several of its effects can be recreated in other keys because creating a wish can't be, but creating a a barrier that prevents evil from entering can be done in another key. Mm -hmm. So you can still cast those spells, they just can't be cast as thaumaturgic spells. And the other half of creation is sorcery, which is the manipulation of magical energy. Any spell can be cast as a sorcery, though some spells are inherently sorcery. Which I can I can certainly um, I can certainly go with that. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the um, class entries, um, are there is is the farther all companion going to be mainly focused on expanding the sandbox for existing classes, or are or are any um, new classes, or in the case of Pathfinder prestige classes, going to be making an appearance? We are wanting to expand the opportunities for existing classes because, from my experience, people don't like playing a class that doesn't have any other support. Because you like being able to choose support from your class from multiple sources, mm -hmm. beats, and uh, various items that care about your class. 
and I do not feel that I could provide enough support for new classes. Uh, um, however, I am doing, in addition to uh, some subtypes, uh, subclasses slash uh, archetypes, I'm doing some that require specific focus, uh, focus and worship of some of the demigods as a stretch goal, which will uh, get closer to that prestige class style, but uh, will just be extra focused archetypes and uh, subclasses mm -hmm. that lean a bit more into that at the cost of uh, some of your more basic features. Yeah. Now, when it comes... When it comes to uh, when it comes to the fact that you're doing um, 5e and um, Pathfinder, how um, what are some what are some of the pitfalls that you've had that you've had that you've had to work with when it comes to accommodating two si two systems at once that have their own um, quirks, let's say? Yeah, um, the biggest thing is as I've been doing this for a few years now, uh, specifically converting 5e and Pathfinder materials together is you can't just take what's written down and slap the other system's rules on it. The thing you need to do is do a complete rewrite based off of the same flavor. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the book for Pathfinder. I write Pathfinder. And I have contracted a uh, friend of mine who does amazing 5e work and I've told them, do what you need to do to make it the best 5e product possible. I don't care if that means, you know, rewriting everything in the book. Because the goal is to create a good product for the system that's being released in. Not to do the exact same thing, but in a different system. Mm -hmm. And that is the biggest pitfall that a lot of... Uh, multi-system support falls in is that they don't want to go that extra step of telling the writer that, hey, if need to, rewrite the whole dang thing. And then you'll get compensated according. Mm -hmm. And um, now when that, that brings me, that brings me to something else that's going to, that's going to be a bit of a, um, a, I, I end up using this phrase a little bit too much, but um, elephant in the room, um, especially especially given the fact that this is that this is based on the on the campaign setting f um, that's a, that's established in 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 Journey Quest and the gamers. Um, how, and that is familiarity, because um, Stanley once said. That every co every comic is someone's first, and to an extent, I feel that can apply to role playing games. So, would so um would someone be would someone be able to set be able to reasonably set up a farther all campaign with the, with this particular guide without having to give pe give people a whole lot of the um a whole lot of the deep lore of the setting. Um, as a GM, I'd recommend the Farther All Companion so that you can get the full lore of the setting. But if you don't care about that, you can just pick an age. And, um, the full PDF, which I have not provided you, I've just provided the work in progress, mm -hmm. will have tables at the front of what races and what gods are available in each age. And you can just basically say, hey, I'm playing... A cyberpunk game, so this is eighth age. Grab anything acceptable in eighth age, and any cyberpunk game will do. Mm -hmm. And you know, you want a traditional fantasy, so you're like, all right, grab the fourth age. Uh, artificers aren't going to fit in very well in the fourth age, but there are some. Like guns exist in the fourth age. They aren't commonplace, but they do exist. Mm -hmm. So you can just be like, okay. Grab everything that's in the fourth age column, and that's all you need to do as a player. Each of the gods has all the lore necessary to reasonably play a worshiper of that god, included in the god's uh, stat block. Yeah. Um, in the in that kind in that kind of thing, when it comes to the ages, um, I would I would like to go I would like to go into since you mentioned it in that regard, I would like to go into what sort of um, 
what sort of what sort of genres of the like would would um would the respective ages um fit fit more naturally and which and which ones might have which ones might um be a little bit trickier and i'd like okay. to, i'd like to start with the age of dream would it be would it be fair to say that the age of dream is um is more is more of your full on um mythic kind of fantasy the kind of thing that would be not too um not too far removed from a from from stuff from stuff like exalted uh i would almost say it's a little bit more than that as the gods directly interact with the few mortals at the time and the mortals are created to worship the gods and to serve specific pur uh, purposes so that is the age of big picture working with the gods interacting on the cosmic scale mm -hmm. shaping the uh the world itself well you describe it i'm kind of reminded of the game black and white <laughs> uh yeah something like that or uh what's it called uh kaleidoscope that might be it mm -hmm. the ones where you're really shaping how the world is created and this is the age when like the underworld is created and things like that mm -hmm. so you can be involved more with the actual creation of the setting so that your farther all if you played in the first stage might have some slight differences from the uh, official farther all setting because your characters made choices that impacted and had ramifications throughout the entire history of part of it all. Mm -hmm. Now, the sec would the second would the second age um, be the be um, be the akin to the to the lost ages of magic that's often described um, in pa in passing in a lot of fantasy settings of the of the wonders that came before. It definitely is. It is the age where. All the cool stuff happens. Mm -hmm. Like, um, it is the age of the highest forms of magic being used. It is the great war between the gods and dragons. It is the formation of the mortal races. It is also the age in which technology is most prevalent until the uh, Eighth Age. Mm -hmm. Because one of the races, instead of having magic, built is built entirely on technology in this age so you have a race of magic a race of divinity basically and a race of technology this is really your time of the lost age of mag magic that doesn't get covered a lot in role-playing games so it will be your uh, chance to play some of that we really big gonzo stuff mm -hmm. um the next would be the age of legends which um would it be fair to say that this is that um that the eight given that the age of legend is is where a lot of the a lot of heroes are going about this would be akin to what's considered heroic fantasy uh yeah it would be your greek mythology your you know viking mythology uh this age you know a man can pick up a uh a wizard uh, sorry, a man who's not a wizard can pick up a river and drink the entire river. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's your big, high, heroic fantasy where the wizards are wizards and the fighters are almost magical in their abilities and things like that. All right. So n next would be the a next would be the age of order, which I think I think that falls into a lot of the standard motifs of high fantasy. Uh, yes, the age of order is really just regular old high fantasy. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there's unique variations, but this is if you're playing a high fantasy game, you can just say you've been playing in the fourth age all alone and not have to change anything. Mm-hmm. It's also notably the first age that has undead. It's just because, uh, go ahead. Yeah, well, because uh, before that, uh, 
something called the Necrofont hadn't begun overflowing. So undead were created as the underworld overflowed into the real world. Mm -hmm. Now, that, br that brings us to the Fifth Age, which... Um... Is the which is the age where the where the gamers take takes place and would this one be more would this one be more be teetering right on the line between between high and um, dark fantasy? Uh, yes, I would definitely say that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is where I would call uh, traditional fantasy or you know dark fantasy where you have that bit of grit. Uh, there's you know a shadow war going on the entire time. There are cults of death. Cults of the Shadow. Uh, there is a, a Charlemanian uh, style uh, theocracy that is ruling one of the governments and is a unity between paladins of three churches. Mm -hmm. But as we see in gamers, uh, there is corruption even in that, where the leader of that order was seeking the mask of death because they were a cultist of death. Mm -hmm. So you also have the questionable morality of if the person that you're working with is even truly on the same side as you. Yeah. Now, that that brings that brings me to the sixth age. Which would it be fair to say that this that um this is where we start entering um aspects of steampunk? And uh, I would say steampunk really starts in the uh, seventh age, but this is really where you're going to start your earliest real technology this is the era where you're doing real like gunslingers are the fisters it's uh 1700s it's post renaissance but not quite to the victorian era mm -hmm. but this is also when magic starts to fail which is the biggest difference and what begins making farther all so unique is you lose access to voyance and creation mm -hmm. which are you know the two schools of magic that contain the abilities of the gods particularly like wishing and re and other forms of altering reality to will mm -hmm. those are no longer part of the world anymore as technology is developing access to magic is receding mm -hmm. and Next would next would be the a the age of steam, which, as you mentioned, that's where um that's where steampunk really start really starts to make its appearance. This is by far the steampunk era. You, if you want blimps and you know clockwork goggles and uh, cogs on your hat, all that, this is the age for you. There's once again less magic, but. Mm -hmm. Firearms are everywhere, and crystallized magic is one of the most valuable substances in the world because you can use it to power literally anything. And uh, this is when most of humanity has united under a single god, and uh, also when the living clockworks that I mentioned earlier, cogs, are a widespread playable race in the setting. Mm-hmm. During this era, you also get steam-powered tanks and, uh, you know, Gatling guns. All the, you know, cool stuff that you would typically associate with steampunk. Mm -hmm. Now, in the, now the Eighth Age, the, eight, the Age of Oil, um, where, where, you start, where we start to see less and less magic and more and more, tech, more, and more technology... Um, it's you referred to, you referred to this age in the um, page as di as diesel punk, but would it be, would it also? But you also mentioned um, cyberpunk could also fall into this. Is it just a case of modern it, modern ish technology in one form or another? Oh yeah, this is your. I I would say like a nineteen sixties onward. You're towards the end of the age. You're going to be playing cyber, uh, cyberpunk or Shadowrun type stuff. Mm -hmm. the beginning of the age, you're going to be the uh, early seven, the late seventies, early eighties, uh, diesel punk style. You know, like Tank Girl. Mm -hmm. and, and oh, oh good. 
this age is also, you know, the end of undeath. There is no more undeath in the world. So you're getting back to a traditional modern fantasy that has, you know, takes place in the real world. Mm -hmm. And you also have, in this age, kaiju. A.K.A. Godzilla and the like. Alexa, play Blue, Blue Oyster Cult. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and the the last stage you described as um as po as post apocalypse, where a lo where a lot of a lot of the technology and a lot of the magic that's been left over is starting to is starting to fade. Yes, no one can cast magic anymore in the Age of Dust. Uh, no civilizations persist at this time, and it's very Mad Max where the civilizations are wandering nomads who set up scrap towns instead of being in a city or anything like that. You're very limited on races in this age to ones that don't rely on magic to exist. Mm hmm so gnomes, elves, and that like are gone. But this is the age that you're going to play Mad Max or Fallout type games. And your wizards are really just tinkerers who can cobble together three pieces of ancient archaeo tech mm -hmm. and make it work for a few years. Yeah. And when it when it com when it comes to the when it com this bring this brings up um some something else when it comes to all these different ages and that is the managing of um equipment um would it be fair of me to assume that you do have a that you're going to have an equipment chapter that's um that's that segments what sort of weapons armor and the like you can get based on age uh yes i will be doing a basic breakdown of this has Dark Ages tech, this has Renaissance Era tech, things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, combine, uh, you know, calling on real world ages to get the technology uh, in a way that people will be able to easily identify. Mm -hmm. Now, what are you sh uh, stretch goals notwithstanding, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? So before stretch goals, I was looking at 80 pages plus some introductory material and tables and charts. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in the 80 to 90 page range there. And then with stretch goals, I'm just the ones I've unlocked already because I've unlocked all the demigods, which I was not originally going to put in the book because they are very varied and are not necessarily things that a person would worship but as it was something that was requested early on i made sure that those were early stretch goals and they are all being added and that will add another eight or more pages to the book there and every single hero from the first gamers movie has been unlocked as a pre-generated NPCs mm -hmm. that people can use to either play as characters or to put in their world as uh, actual interpretations of the characters as they are going to be representing the power level of the character from the uh, series. And each one of those will add two, maybe three pages to the book. And so far, all of the gamers ones are unlocked, which is five of them, so... We're already in the range of 100 plus pages. And uh, I can, I'll, cer I'll certainly be keeping an eye on how, on how that develops because, um, well, with with that kind with that kind of pages comes a whole comes a whole lot of sh a whole lot of shuffling, <laughs> and a lot of, a lot of that is just due to the fact that. Organ um, navigation is a big th is a big deal for me. Oh yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure you've suffered the horror of books without indexes, just like I have. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, one of the big things that I'm going to add in uh, the final PDF that, as I said, isn't in the work in progress because 
I find it a pain to do beforehand, is a table of contents. Mm -hmm. It will be in the front of the book that is separated by chapter and also, like, say it's the races, you're going to be, there's an, Dwarf will tell you exactly what page it's on. Elf will tell you exactly what page it's on. Things mm -hmm. like that. And with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? I know, I know that um, there's that at the time of this recording, you've got 18 days to go before the before the end of the Kickstarter. So, as you can see, mm -hmm. uh, writing for the pre-stretch goal t content was complete at uh, beginning of project. Mm -hmm. My goal is to have all stretch goal text finalized by end of November and sent to manufacturing by end of December. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll be, um, I'll obviously be keeping a keeping a close eye on how how that develops, and I I look forward to s I look forward to seeing the insanity that comes out that comes out of it, but. With that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Yeah, definitely. I uh, enjoyed doing this, and I'm glad that you approached me for this interview. Mm -hmm. It's been fun talking about it. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further delve into far Farther All or... Um, to or to lament the de to lament the, the death of yet another bard, um, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>